Good morning once again. I'm so glad that you could join us this morning as we prepare our hearts uh, to receive from the Word of God. I want to introduce someone who's probably new to some of you who are watching this morning, but many of you, you know her. She's been a member of the church here at Gateway for many, many years. She's part of our, our board of deacons, and I believe that she has a word from the Lord this Pentecost Sunday. Pentecost is 50 days after Easter. It was, uh, it was a celebration in the Old Testament, very, very important for us in the New Covenant, for those in the New Testament who are following followers of Jesus. Really looking forward to, ha- to hearing what you have to say, what God has given you this morning, Nikki. Why don't you welcome her with me this morning? Thanks, Matt. Uh, good morning, everyone. So this is a new experience. I have i don't think I've ever preached a sermon before, and I've certainly never done it while it's being recorded for YouTube. And, uh, and then I'll be... Uh, doing it live again in the park on Sunday. So it's like, go big or go home, I guess. <laughs> Here we are. <laughs> so i um, just really thankful for having this opportunity. Matt asked me a few weeks ago if I would um, consider preaching. And I said yes right away without thinking it all the way through. But then as we got spe- talking to each other, um, he asked me if I had something that was on my heart. And I had to think a little bit about that. And as I started to let ideas percolate, um, I asked if he would trust me to preach on Pentecost Sunday because I felt that the message that was on my heart um, directly related to that. And so uh, today I get the opportunity to give this a go. So I'd like to start by just telling a little bit of a story. uh, So my husband, Paul, uh, he has a real love for music, like listening to music. And I know that when we met... Back in the day, uh, we used to go to the Christian bookstore all the time and buy the latest Christian CDs, whatever had come out. And and we just had like oodles and oodles of CDs. Of course, things have changed nowadays. Uh, And before uh, we stopped having in-person services, Paul would often be on the soundboard here at the church. And one of the things he really enjoyed doing was putting together a unique playlist on the days when he was going to be on the soundboard that he could play like prior to the service and as the service was had ended. And, um, and of course, that hasn't been possible recently. So uh, just over a year ago, he decided to try something and uh, he, he got a Spotify account and he found some online websites and he started to put together a Spotify playlist the top 40 Christian songs that were sort of hitting the charts that particular week and he started to um, very religiously every Tuesday evening he would update his playlist and he would post it to Spotify and he would also post that a link to it on his Facebook and on his Instagram and he started to get a few followers so if you've ever um paid attention to Spotify, you can see how many people sort of subscribe or follow your account. And so, you know, it's, it, the numbers started to grow just slowly. And uh, we were, I think it was last Christmas time, uh, we were in the Lower Mainland uh, picking up our son from college and we ran into some old friends and they said, oh, we love your Spotify playlist. We download it every week. And that was like a huge surprise to us because as you might know, you know people are following you, but you don't know who's following you. And, and so this was kind of inspiring for Paul. And so over the last little while, he's decided to increase his social media presence. And so he started to post his, um, his, his playlist on, t- on uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And now he's got these Instagram stories where he tags the artists and he's really upped his game. It's like he's looking very professional. Well, when you start tagging artists, the next thing you know, the artists start to like post your story on their story on Instagram. And they're really excited. They're like, yay, look, someone posted my, my, a link to my song. And those artists don't know Paul. And Paul doesn't know them. But in this weird way... Paul has become this, like, on a very small scale, an influencer in the Christian music scene because he promotes certain artists. Then they post stuff about him, which then gets people looking at what he's posting. And there's this interesting cycle that goes around. And so, um, although it's on a small scale, Paul's up to 231 followers as of today. (laughs) 
And we don't even know who those people are. And it grows every week. So it's really just really interesting to watch. Now, he doesn't do this because he makes any money from it. He doesn't do it for any reason other than he loves Christian music and he wants to share it um, and that love with other people. So, and it turns out other people like it too. So over the past decade, we have seen this rise in uh, internet, like social media. And I was looking at some, t- some statistics. And if we look at the population of the world, 13 and over, over 58% of the world is on some kind of social media platform. And when we look at just North America, that rises to 82%. So the majority of us adults are on some kind of social media. So of course, if social media is such a big deal, we're gonna find a way to monetize it. And so influencers are people who build a, have built a reputation uh, for their knowledge and expertise on a topic, and then they use that um, to make regular posts on their social media platform of choice to generate like large followings of enthusiastic and energetic people who wanna hear what they have to say or see what kind of choices that they're making. And so brands, so it pick any brand, big brand, they love social media influencers because they can leverage the influence of those people to create trends and promote their product. So individuals, corporations, um, brands all share their stories and they influence their audiences all over the world into the, the farthest corners of the world to make choices. Now this isn't new, influence is not a new thing, this particular platform is. But if we were to look back um, to the days when Jesus was roaming the earth, uh, we would see that there were influencers in that culture as well. And so one of them was the Pharisees. The Pharisees were the most numerous and influential of all the religious sects of Jesus' day. And they were strict legalists they had um, dedicated themselves to preserving the, uh, the law, so the Mosaic law, and they were trying really hard to push out any pagan or foreign religious influences that might come and dilute or confuse uh, the Jewish um, beliefs. And so They weren't always great guys. Some of them were great guys. Some of them were hypocritical or self-righteous. But their beliefs uh, were were strong. And their influence was even stronger. And so even a guy like Herod, who at the time was working for the Romans, of course, um, overseeing the area of Judea, he wouldn't um, attack the the uh, Pharisees because he knew that attacking them could put his hold on that kingdom in jeopardy. So uh, he recognized the influence that they had over the people. So if we kind of set the scene, um, we're setting the scene for this day of Pentecost. And so here we are, we're in this time when the Pharisees have recently colluded with the Romans to have Jesus crucified. Now if we think about it, you can see they would want to crucify Jesus because in their mind, he is uh, like he's a heretic. He's going against um, all the things that they've been trying to preserve. And so he's been charged, he's been um, executed, crucified. But what we know, because we know the end of the story, is that he is also risen from the dead. And so we come to this period of time between Passover and Pentecost, which were both uh, Uh, Jewish holidays that often involved a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. So we have this period of time in between these two pilgrimages where Jesus has actually been hanging out with the apostles. So we don't often get a sense of that as we're reading the, the story in the Bible, but it's been almost 50 days since he, um, rose from the dead and rejoined them. And during this time, Luke reports that Jesus has been teaching them about the kingdom of God. Now, this is a new way of looking at the kingdom of God because Jesus is talking about how things have changed since his death and resurrection. And so this is some new learning for these guys. And so it's interesting and definitely not going to be a coincidence that at the time when 
Jesus um, uh, comes and speaks to them and then leaves, that there's all of these Jews from all over. So they've all come from different areas um, in the region. They all have come with their different languages and their different ways of doing things. And they've all come to Jerusalem at the same time to celebrate uh, Pentecost. So it sounds like this like perfect breeding ground for like a COVID-19 outbreak, but something different is going to break out during this time. And so I want to take a few minutes to read. And so we're going to read from Acts 1 uh, verses 9 to 4, or sorry, 4 to 9. And then we're going to skip to Acts 2 and I'm going to read the entire chapter. So pray for me. That's a lot of reading. (laughs) So Acts 1 verse 4. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he, this is Jesus, gave them this commandment. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So they met together. They asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the time or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now, there were, staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, are, you not all, sorry, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in their own native language? Parthians, okay, I'm going to say all these wrong. Clearly not being gifted with the gift of tongues right now. <laughs> Uh, Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, uh, Pry- Phrygia, uh, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, Rome, both Jews and converts of Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues, Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. Then Peter addressed the crowd. He stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on, the, on the, my servant, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said this about him. I saw the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. 
Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body will also live in hope because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your holy ones see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words he warned them, and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. And those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings, and to the fellowship and breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their numbers daily those who were being saved. Um, That's a passage I've read lots of times in my life. And there's nothing like trying to prepare a sermon to bring (laughs) the words to life. Um, I was thinking about this, the apostles. So there are 12 apostles. Seven of them were fishermen. Uh, We think one was probably a tax collector. One was a religious and political zealot. And we don't even know what the other guys did. So we're not talking about like the movers and shakers of Jerusalem. Uh, We're talking about 12 just kind of in the trenches guys. And it's when they're filled with the Holy Spirit, just as they were promised, just as we read at the beginning, of that scripture, that they suddenly find themselves in this place of influence. So can you imagine, like, Simon Peter, he's the guy who just spoke to all these people. He's standing up in this, in front of this big crowd. Now, this is not like, this is not his church congregation. This is not his high school grad class. This is literally, he's standing in front of people that he's never met before, thousands of them. And he delivers a sermon. And then 3,000 people come to faith. And we're talking about a brand new faith. Like a faith that just, like, was just born. Like, two months ago. And it's during a religious holiday. That's not the same (laughs) as what they're being asked to do. So these God-fearing Jewish believers hear this message for the very first time and come to faith. And so we can only imagine that the Holy Spirit is at work in this particular time because his impact, his influence is um, beyond measure, really. So why does Peter have this impact? Well, I think there are like four things that we can pull out of this. First, the apostles waited with a patient anticipation and obedience. 
Jesus had instructed them to wait for something that they didn't really even understand. He asked them to wait for the gift of the Father, which was going to be the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They aren't out starting up an uprising because their friend Jesus was unjustly killed, and they aren't blaming one another for their individual actions that led to the crucifixion. Instead, they're spending their time praying and seeking the gift of the Father. That takes time. You have to spend time in the Word, and you have to spend time praying if we're going to make a difference. Second, the group of believers are filled with the Holy Spirit. So they began to speak in tongues, and then the Spirit was on them, and they literally had a gift that spoke into the hearts of the people who were listening there. There are a lot of different gifts that we can get, knowledge and healing and prophecy, but the gift they were given that day was the gift that mattered, and it was the gift that made the difference. Third, Peter quoted scripture. Now Peter, because... Uh, of his upbringing, as with all these men, they would have known um, the, the writings that uh, make up the Torah. And so when he spoke, he was able to quote scripture from heart. He quoted um, David, and he quoted Joel. And these were men that all of these listeners had heard of before. And so those men who they knew about, who had been the influencers, gave power to Peter's words. And so if we spend time in the word and we're able to bring those truths forward, it speaks into the hearts of the listener. And finally, I think Peter clearly articulated the truth. He made it very simple for the people who were listening. He um, He told them what they were seeing and hearing was from the Holy Spirit. He told them that Jesus had been a descendant of David, as had been prophesied in the scriptures, and that he had risen again and now sat at the right hand of God. He told them that if they wanted to be believers, they needed to to repent, be baptized, receive forgiveness for their sins, and that if they did those things, they would receive the Holy Spirit. He didn't make it complicated. There were no special rituals that they needed to complete. They just needed to follow those words. And we see that 3,000 of them did, followed by many who continued to add to their numbers in the days that followed. What's really encouraging is that those people didn't stay in Jerusalem. Eventually, they left. And they went back to their homes. They went back to their communities. And when they went to those places, they continued to spread the good news that they had heard. They became influencers in their new neighborhoods. And the number of followers continued to grow. So what does this mean for us? In Matthew 28, 18 to 20, Matthew says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you to the very end of the age. Nothing has changed. We are supposed to be like Peter and the other disciples. We are commissioned to be influencers, operating in the giftings of the Holy Spirit, and spreading the saving message of Jesus. Each of us has influence. It might be in your workplace or your book club. You might have influence on your rec hockey team or in your mom group. And you might be active on social media. Maybe you already have hundreds or thousands of followers. Uh, Lee Stein is an author who recently published an essay in the New York Times titled The Empty Religions of Instagram. How did influencers become our moral authorities? She has a lot of great points in her essay and it was really difficult to choose just one. So I chose three. Here's what she says. Many millennials who have turned their backs on religious tradition have found alternative scriptures online. 
Our new belief system is a blend of left-wing political orthodoxy, intersectional feminism, self-optimization, therapy, wellness, astrology, and Dolly Parton. She says, and we've, off, and we've found a different kind of clergy, personal growth influencers, women who offer people like us permission, validation, and community on demand at a time when it's nearly impossible to share communion in person. We don't even have to put down our phones. But then she says, there is a chasm between the vast scope of our needs and what influencers can provide. We're looking for guidance in the wrong places. Instead of helping us to engage with our most important questions, our screens might be distracting us from them. So as we contemplate our influence and those we influence, I have a few questions for you. Who are you following? Whose scripture are you reading? If Instagram or TikTok or YouTube is your Jerusalem, Whose message are you hearing? Another one we can ask ourselves is, how many followers do, followers do I have? Who is looking to me for wisdom? Who is watching my moves or listening to my advice? Who do I influence? And then finally, where does our influence come from? Like Peter, can we say that what you now see and hear is from the outpouring of the Holy Spirit? That's my prayer. That I am guarding my heart and listening to the right messages. That I'm guarding the hearts of others by being a good influence. And that I'm seeking the outpouring of the Holy Spirit so that the influence that I do have is directly from God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, at this time on this day of Pentecost, Lord, we recognize that your Holy Spirit is a gift from the Father, a gift that comes to change our hearts, Lord, to turn our eyes to you, and to give us power that can only come from being in relationship with you. Lord, I thank you that we have this gift, this sense of your presence that is with us here on earth. Lord, we thank you for the gift of your sacrifice that was necessary so that we could have the Holy Spirit with us. And Lord, I pray that even today, for those who are listening, God, if you could pour in, that they would seek your Holy Spirit, seek your word, seek your knowledge, God. And Lord, as that Holy Spirit pours through them, that you would use them as people of influence in the world, in their small corners of the earth, or on their vast media social, social media platform, God. Use us, I pray. Fill us, I pray. And help us to be like your apostles as we go out and fulfill the Great Commission. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for tuning in today.